Greetings from Knoxville, Tennessee. Francis Hodgson Burnett, the internationally popular English-born author of classics such as Little Roy Fauntleroy, lived in Knoxville during the 1860s and 1870s. None of her homes, including the legendary Vagabondia, have survived, but you can visit a whimsical tribute to a famous novel, The Secret Garden, at the Knoxville Botanical Garden and Arboretum, from your friends at the Knoxville History Project. Hi, everybody. Um, I just want to thank you on behalf of the Humanities Tennessee and some of our key sponsors, Metro Nashville Arts Commission, Ingram Content Group, Tennessee Arts Commission, Vanderbilt University, and Parnassus Books. Um, there are going to be links to buy the author's books in the chat from Parnassus. My name is Tyler Sonato. I am going to be the moderator. I am a librarian here in Nashville, Tennessee, and we are being joined today by Ruta Sepetti and Andrew Marinus. Hi guys! Hi. Hey everybody! Okay, so before we start, I want to introduce both of you guys a little bit deeper. Um, so ladies first, Ruta is an internationally acclaimed number one New York Times best-selling author of historical fiction that is published in over 60 countries and 40 languages. Ruta is considered a crossover novelist as her books are read by both our young people and adults worldwide. She is the winner of the Carnegie Medal, she is renowned for giving voice to the underrepresented in history and those who experienced it. Her books have won or have been shortlisted for over 40 book prizes, are included on over 30 state reading lists, and are currently in development for film and television. And Ruta lives here in Tennessee. Then we have Andrew. He is also a New York Times bestselling author. Like y'all, we have two New York Times bestselling authors um, of narrative nonfiction. His first book is Strong Inside, and it was the recipient of the 2015 Lillian Smith Book Award and the Lone Special Recognition Honor of the 2015 RFK Book Awards. The Young Reader Edition was named one of the top 10 biographies in top 10 sports books of 2017 by the American Library Association and was selected as a notable social studies book for 2019 by the National Council for Social Studies. Andrew also lives here in Tennessee. So with that, I just want to join these two wonderful humans. Um, I do want to say the way that this is going to go is going to kind of be like an icebreaker game-ish. And then I'm going to ask them some questions. And then I'm going to give Ruta and Andrew some time to like talk together, but then also answer any questions you guys have. So you can post in the chat, or you guys can post on Facebook, and those will get filtered into us. So are you ready? I'm ready. Good, I, I feel like I'm in the classroom and I'm just like screaming. Okay, <laughs> so like I love to um, throw icebreakers at people where they're just like, I say like a word or a phrase or something and then you just say the first thing that comes to mind. <laughs> oh no, oh no. So, <laughs> I love when you have no idea and we're just gonna go. <laughs> so <clears throat> we'll start light and then make our way to something. Um, I don't know, we'll just see where it goes. Okay, so. The first one is quarantine snack. Quarantine snack. Mm -hmm. We were just talking about that this morning, actually, with my kids, and they picked for me, and they were correct. But I've been a big ginger snap eater over the quarantine. Uh, just like this bag of ginger snaps from the grocery store has been my definitely my go-to snack the last couple of months. Very cool. Mine definitely jalapeno potato chips and perhaps an adult beverage or two help uh -huh. me. <laughs> Maybe that with some ginger good, in there. <laughs> I like it. Okay. Um, fall activity. Um, for me, definitely hiking, 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 hiking. As the saying goes, you know, to go inside, I go outside. And I, I love being outside. 
Oh, that's great, Ruta. I would say the same thing. That's one benefit of this whole quarantine, actually, is we've discovered several uh, hiking spots fairly close to our house and have loved doing that as a family. And actually, right now, the last two days, we've been out at Montgomery Bell State Park uh, hiking. I know the kids are out there hiking right now while we're doing this. Nice. Wow, I love that. I really do. It's something that we needed during this time. Um, okay, favorite holiday? I, Ruta, go ahead. Lithuanian Independence Day. <laughs> cool. <laughs> I've never heard um, that answer. <laughs> <laughs> I think that uh, Thanksgiving is probably my favorite holiday for sure. So looking forward to that soon. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Then your favorite side dish. Oh, like at the Thanksgiving table. Uh -huh. um, I think mashed potatoes and, and mac and cheese are big favorites of mine. I guess if I need to say a green vegetable, um, I've become a Brussels sprouts guy as I've gotten older, for sure. Stuffing for me, <laughs> which might also be a metaphor that applies to my writing. <laughs> Stuffing. <laughs> okay, what about board game? Oh. Well, I think my parents are listening to this right now, and they sent us dog bingo uh, a month ago, and the kids love it. So we play a lot of dog bingo in our house. That's cute. A board game. You know, not a board game, but puzzles. I love puzzles. Okay. Uh -huh. Okay. We've been doing a lot of puzzles these last few months for sure. Did y'all see that there's like a new puzzle coming out? It's called like, I don't know what it's called, but it's, um, they just made a couple of them and there's like something happens when you finish it. It's not just like you look at it. Um, mm -hmm. Something like magical-esque happens. I don't really? know. Really? Yeah, I haven't seen that. That's there's, always the um, question. What do you do when you're done? You just put it yeah. back in the box and so anticlimactic. So that's what they're trying yeah. to like go against, I guess. You know, it's like when you put money towards something, um, they're like having a fundraiser and only selling so many first. Anyway, mm -hmm. if we tried to get one for my sister-in-law and they were all sold out. All right. Um, okay, self-care. Solitude. Absolute solitude. And solitude is like my greatest inspiration. Um, and that probably makes me pretty cliche writer, right? Because we feel like writing is such a solitary thing, but I, I love solitude. I would be one of those people who would like try to live in silence for a year. <laughs> mm -hmm. That sounds appealing to me too, Ruta. Um, <laughs> Self-care, I don't think I do quite a good job at that, but for me, it's... Um, kind of vegging out with a, a, a sporting event of some kind, either going to it or watching it on TV. That's when I feel like I relax and don't worry about anything uh, is when I'm around sports. Like the Lakers game last night? <laughs> Are you a Lakers fan? <laughs> I'm a LeBron fan. You're a LeBron? Oh, mm -hmm. okay. All right. Yeah, I'm a Milwaukee <laughs> Brewers fan. They're out of the baseball playoffs right now. So that's become stress-free for me too. I don't care anymore. So yeah <laughs> okay um what about spotify what do you have playing on spotify i have uh, this uh yacht what i call yacht rock yacht rock playlist um uh with all of these songs from, from the 70s um you know yeah very cliche but i love it <laughs> fun that's funny you mentioned the 70s Rudo, because one thing I do when I'm working on my books is try to listen to music from the era that I'm writing about. Except when I wrote about the 36 Olympics, I didn't go back that far. But um, <laughs> with Strong say. Inside, I listened to music from the 60s, which was fun and um, with uh, Singled Out and the new book I'm working on, which also takes place in the 70s. I've been listening to a lot of disco music. Nice. And do you listen to music while you write? No, I, I'm not able to do that. But um, in the car or other times when I'm not working, I'll try to listen to that music. But I, someone was asking that, Tyler. We were on a, a um, Zoom with the State Library Association a couple of weeks ago, and there was a question about listening to music mm -hmm. when you write. And I'm not able to do that. Are you, Ruta? No, I'm not. Um, some people know that I worked in the music business for 22 years before becoming an author. And when I listen to music, I am dissecting, you know, oh, the, he's using a fretless bass. Oh, look, that's a double bass, double bass pedal, you know, on the drums. No, and it pulls me out. But like you, Andrew, 
I music is a huge inspiration for me. I listen, I take walks, I create these videos in my head of the scenes in the book and I can, you know, see what's going on. So, but not while I write, it's too distracting. Right. So interesting. I love it. Um, Cause I am not a musician. And so my brain doesn't do that. My husband is, and he's like, really that one song, you know, you hear that thing over and over and I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> I just like it. <laughs> yeah. um, okay, your favorite, I was gonna ask about hiking. So um, do y'all have a favorite spot that you like always go to or is it different every time? We live near Smith Park in Brentwood. Um, we've discovered that one over the last few months. We also go to Deerwood Arboretum um, and then uh, Timberland Park down by Natchez Trace has been fun for us. And like I said, we're out at Montgomery Bell uh, right now and there's several trails out there. So uh, our kids are 10 and seven. They're not too picky. As long as we get outside, we're together as a family, we're, we're having fun. That's something that some you know viewers, if, you're, if they're not from Tennessee, might not understand. I mean, the natural beauty that this state has in terms of hiking and, and fishing and camping. And um, and like Andrew, I love Deerwood. Um, I like the Owl Sanctuary. Um, mm -hmm. And we have a cabin that's out on the Center Hill side. And like Center, Center Hill is two hours from everything. So tomorrow, for example, we're going to um, go and hike Twin Arches. And I've never hiked Twin Arches. So I'm really excited about that. Cool. Great. Okay, I have two more. Library or bookstore? <gasps> oh, <laughs> that's how can we answer that, Tyler? Uh. <laughs> I will say honestly, for me, library and bookstore have very different um, functions. Like the research material that I need, a bookstore is not going to have. When I need something that's on interlibrary loan, mm. do you have this book from 1926? Uh, you know, so so different for me. How do I, uh, bookstore for, oh no, but I, I was going to say bookstore, you know, for reading, but here's the other thing. Um, a, I have to give a shout out to Parnassus Books, our local bookstore, because they're really, really very unique. And I don't want to say that I don't research in bookstores because some of my ideas for novels have actually come from booksellers or, you know, I can't answer, as you can tell. That <laughs> Andrew, go ahead. Yeah. No, I feel the same way. I would say library as an author that, you know, how uh, much time is spent in archives and, and reading books from libraries. But just as a person, I love going to a new bookstore, you know, and mm -hmm. whenever I'm out visiting schools, I try to find you know, the best independent bookstore in that town. And those are, it's always fun to see. So for sure. But, you know, give a shout out to school librarians. Uh, I know Ruta and I both would say our careers wouldn't exist without school librarians. So, um, and this is teacher day, right? So yeah, gotta give a shout out to school libraries for sure. Um, yeah. Okay. And then, um, so it's election season, early voting or uh, voting on election day? Uh, this generally I vote on election day, but this year I am going to vote early. I would say the same. I used to think there was something fun about voting on election day, being part of that, but there's no excuse for not getting your vote in and counted. Uh, and so I think it's important to vote as early as you possibly can. Yeah. Very cool. And in Tennessee today is the last day to register to vote. Right. So thanks. Good t -shirt, cool. Tyler. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. Let's talk. Actually, you hit on this with your um, with answering the library question. You both write um, so with Games of Deception in all of your books, Andrew, and then Fountains of Silence in your other books. You guys both write like historical fiction versus nonfiction, right? But you do so. You have to do so much research for the books that you're writing. Um, so I'm just curious, like, what is that process like for each of you? Go ahead, Ruta. Oh. Um, for me, um, the research, I love it. I think I love research just as much, if not more than um, than writing. And I always start with nonfiction. And um, I've often said in the you know author notes that my work, historical fiction, sits on the shoulders of nonfiction. So I go first to 
um, academic papers, nonfiction texts, memoir, testimony, because if I want to write about something, I want to be educated on that subject because my next step is to find the true witnesses, people who are connected to the event I'm writing about and interview them. And so I don't concern myself with my minute details at the outset, but after I've read all the nonfiction, after I've done literally for each book, hundreds of interviews, and that allows me to see where I'm hearing common themes and seeing common experience. And perhaps I want to reflect that um, where I'm seeing really unique experience that makes me question, hmm, is this family fiction or is this, you know, a false narrative or is it true? But then when I get into the revision state, the research, and I wonder, Andrew, if you're like this, and I, I question about games of deception, I will go to such lengths for a small detail. Because as Andrew mentioned, we are so fortunate to have students, teachers, and librarians as our readers. And I don't want to let anyone down, not to mention the true witnesses. So I'll go to the ends of the earth in that revision stage for research. Well, that's great. Yeah, I love the research. I'm in the middle of research for a book right now. Um, and I actually think it is the most fun part of the whole project for me, um, finding pieces of information that you know are going to help build a great scene in the book, um, discovering new people to interview that have great stories to tell that you didn't know were out there, you know, um, reading other people's books. I could spend uh, weeks just looking through old newspaper articles and, and finding little details uh, to help tell a story. Um, so I think in in Ruta's type of nonfiction or fiction and my type of uh, narrative nonfiction, the research is the most important part. You know, um, in writing nonfiction, every single sentence is a product of the research that you've done. And um, if you don't do the real research, you're really going to struggle and the writing will suffer for it. Um, and so uh, to me, the, the research is the most fun part of writing the book. It's where you're gaining the material that you're going to be able to share with everyone. And Andrew, do you find that, can you research one project while you're, let's say, in revisions on another? Do you kind of overlap like that a little bit or? Yeah, um, and thanks. I mean, I, I have to say also, I wanted to say this. I owe so much to Ruta um, as a mentor and she's so kind to have my book sitting there along with her book behind her <laughs> right now. But one of the pieces of advice that she gave me, um, you know, and some, I told her I wanted to build a career as an author and she said, well, you know, um, part of that is continuing to produce, you know, and having multiple books out there. And so right now I'm in this situation where it's strong out for a few years. Um, Games of Deception has been out since November. Uh, Singled Out will come out in March. And so I'm in the final revisions and building my own publicity ideas uh, for that book right now. And then in the middle of pretty intense research, uh, traveling to um, archives and interviewing people for uh, another book that'll come out in two years. So I'm finally feeling that being in different stages of multiple books at the first time. And it's a lot of fun. Oh my God, I, I don't know if that would be fun. I think that would be <laughs> intense. That's, inc that's incredible. And honestly, that's very kind of you to say that, but I just think we live in Nashville, which is a community and our friend Keith Cartwright introduced us. We happened to be together at the same coffee shop. And that's how this, and all of this you have done on your own. I'm just, you know, happy to <laughs> have been in the sidecar cheering you on. And we're published by the same publisher, which is so fun because we're not only like, let's say neighbors and shop at the same bookstore and, and you know, <laughs> frequent the same schools and libraries, but we're, we're published by Philomel Books, which is just amazing. Yeah, it's just terrific. And no, Ruth, I owe it to you. So thank you. Mm. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. It's so sweet. It's so cool also like as a reader of, of both of you guys to see you as like real humans and like being able to have conversations and not being like competitive or like, you know, they always say don't meet like your heroes. And it's just really inspiring as like a reader to see interactions like that that are positive and uplifting too. Well, just real quickly, I think Ruta has this uh, abundance mindset. You know, you hear about those different types of mindsets that you can have and the abundance one is there's enough for everybody. You know, and if you support other authors, that doesn't hurt you as mm -hmm. an author. That's good for the whole industry. And um, Ruth is terrific like that. And so it's an example to all the rest of us that know her. Oh, that is so kind. I just want to love everyone. <laughs> <laughs> we need that right now, Ruta. <laughs> we need it. Um, okay, so 
I'm, I am, you guys have bring a lot to your books, right? Like, so they're, um, they're historical, right? They're real. Um, but there's a lot of emotion at certain points in your books. Um, and so my question for you guys is like, how do you deal with the emotional impacts on yourself as you're writing through these stories? But, um, I'll go first. I mean, I think, um, especially my first couple of books reflected history that was experienced by my own personal family members. And of course, that was really intense. But when I'm feeling that, I also try to remind myself that, man, that's the essence of being human. I love that I'm an easy crier, you know? I mean, to, to the chagrin of many in my family, they're like, she's crying again. Um, but I love that. I think that's the essence of being human. So I don't shy away from it. I also feel that if I'm crying or if I'm emotionally charged when I'm writing the book, hopefully the reader will feel a connection when they're reading the book. And that's my goal to make this history human, you know, bring the readers to the page and keep them there, you know, with a human connection. That's great. I think for me, um, part of it has been willing to become a bit of an advocate for the people that I'm writing about or um, the stories that I'm telling. So when I wrote a biography of Perry Wallace, I felt this incredible emotion that he deserved more, you know? And so part of uh, writing the book was to uh, elevate his story and give him more of a uh, platform, people be able to learn from him. Uh, there was also emotion like, well, it shouldn't just stop with the book, you know? And so being personally invested and Perry and looking for ways for him to um, share what he could offer, which was so much about the way we treat each other and racism and looking for ways for him to be honored and for more people to learn his story and um, coming personally attached to that. Uh, I can already feel the same thing happening with uh, Singled Out, which is a biography of the first openly gay major league baseball player, you know, Glenn Burke, whose story really isn't known. And so I want to channel that emotion I have that this is a story that deserves to be known into, um, you know, activities that go beyond just the book. How else can I devote myself to this person's story? Um, the other part of it, though, I think for me has been learning how to separate myself from myself as an author versus myself as uh, the rest of my life, <laughs> you know, and staying uh, grounded in my job, I'm um, trying to do a good job uh, at Vanderbilt where I work, trying to be a good father and husband and not getting carried away with um, the some of the excitement that comes with being an author. And you could be tempted to um, uh, mis have misplaced priorities, you know, and so that's been really important for me to, as I've grown as an author. Yeah, and I think that's important also within the author community. Um, and I find that Nashville has a super supportive author community. Um, but when it comes down to it, as Andrew's saying, you have to ask yourself, okay, wait, you know, a reality check. Who do I love and who loves me? You know? <laughs> and and, yeah. and hey, sometimes these big corporations, they can't love us back. That's not just, you know, and we have to, right, Andrew, we got to come to terms, but we always know if we can email one another, it's like, oh, I love you, man. I love you too. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Very cool. Okay. I want to also give you guys some time to like ask each other questions. You know each other really well. Um, you guys work, you know, I'm sure that you guys have read some things before maybe perhaps. Um, but yeah, just, I want to give you some space and time to like have this and ask some questions. Okay. Ruda, I've got one for you. And we've kind of alluded to this a little bit, I think in this conversation, but and I'm not somebody that loves like motivational quotes and things, but there was one that hit me the other day just about the importance of the, the journey and enjoying the journey and appreciating it as opposed to putting all your eggs in the basket. And, and I was curious for you when you were writing The Fountains of Silence, what were the points along the way that meant the most to you? You know, whether it was during the research or people you interviewed, um, or even uh, if you want to go bigger than that, just spe that specific book. But in terms of just being an author, what, what do you really um, appreciate most about the, the journeys to completing your books? 
Well, with, um, with The Fountains of Silence, it was different than my other books because as I mentioned, all three books were parts of my family history. And then I came to write The Fountains of Silence, um, which is set in Spain during the dictatorship of Francisco Franco. Um, I am not Spanish. Uh, and you know that question comes up, what right do we have to history other than our own? And how can I tell this story? And how can I tell it accurately um, and empathetically? And a beautiful part of the journey initially was that it was the people in Spain themselves that asked me to write this book. Um, and it was young people, young readers who said, you know, we don't fully understand our history because of the pact of forgetting in Spain. We're not able to talk about it, but maybe as an outsider, you can. And so that journey of being this tourist myself almost, you know, unaware and coming to know the complexity of this history. I mean, the Franco dictatorship, there were some people when I said, oh, I'm writing about Spain during the Franco era, a couple people said, oh, I love Spain. I visited several times. Remind me, who's Franco? And throughout the process of taking this hidden history and finding this connection point, as I mentioned previously, with human beings, to me, that is the most rewarding part of the journey. Um, and trying to write the book in a way that would represent, history has different angles, that would represent these different angles of history. And getting to know those different angles of history myself, I, I learn so much more than, let's say, the readers say, oh, I learned so much from your book. I learned so much. And for me, that's what keeps me going. You know, what is history hiding from us? And that's just mm -hmm. such a rewarding part of the journey. Oh, that's great. I, I, hey, I see a question in the chat here. I could go ahead and answer it too before you ask yours. It's from um, from Esther in Oakland. And Oakland is a key city for me right now because Glenn Burke uh, was from Bay Area. He played for the Oakland A's. So I'm hoping that after COVID, I can come out to Oakland. But she asked um, in terms of school visits about a, a funny and poignant experiences uh, at school visits. Um, one that was really fun for me was at the Texas School for the Deaf in Austin, Texas. And I had never had an um, opportunity to speak at a school for, for deaf students before. So that was really, uh, she asked about poignant and funny in both respects because uh, the um, sign language interpreter was right next to me and I was talking about Perry Wallace having uh, been a great slam dunker as a basketball player in high school and how he would do these tomahawk dunks and 360 reverse swish swash dunks that would bring the crowd down and the sign language interpreter must have been a great basketball player herself. These dunks that she was doing as she was interpreting for the students, unbelievable. And I had to stop and just watch her uh, um, imitate these slam dunks, which was great. Um, I think the most meaningful school visit, um, well, another funny one was this, this uh, group of students had prepared questions for me uh, that the, the librarian had. We were doing sort of a trivia contest. And one of the questions about my own book, the students got right and I got wrong, you know, so uh, <laughs> that, that was funny. But I love it when I meet a student that um, that isn't known as the kid that comes in the library very often or isn't really a reader, but maybe they play uh, uh, sports, you know, and they say, oh, I really liked that book. Or the teacher or librarian says, you know, uh, this kid read Strong Insider Games of Deception. We're so happy because they finally came in the, into the library, you know, and those are the readers I'm hoping to attract along with the, the seasoned readers, but the, the, the kids that haven't discovered that joy yet, hopefully um, through a, a sports book can be a little bit uh, non-intimidating maybe to them. And that, that really means a lot to me. Well, not only the book, but, but you are so engaging. I, I mean, how many school visits do you do a year, Andrew? How many? Uh, I don't, it's, I mean, it's really tailed off since, since typically I'll try to be on the road as much as I can, as much as the family will let me, you know, so a couple of week, if I can do it. You do hundreds. Yeah. I'm just saying you yeah. do hundreds of school visits per year. And yes. I just have to say. I know you do too. I, yeah, but, but you have such a sense of justice. And I see even in the pictures and the comments from the teachers and librarians, um, you know, the kids who go in thinking, oh, to the gymnasium, what is this going to be? And the pictures after their faces with you. And so if anyone's out there wondering, oh, you know, this sounds like an interesting book. I'm telling you, Andrew's amazing. And it's bad. Like these are bas basketball books. And um, I just can't recommend. 
highly enough. I would love to come to your school visit. So. <laughs> well, thank you, Ruta. It means a lot. You know, I see a question in the chat um, from someone that we both admire, uh, Andrew and Neely. I'm Dr. Neely. Oh yes. From from Vanderbilt, and um, she, Dr. Neely at Vanderbilt, supported me from the very beginning. Supported um, Andrew, then supported us. You know, together trying to Absolutely. get young adult books. And and Anne is asking about you know what are our routines? So like, what is your routine? <laughs> My routine is a lack of routine. Um, <laughs> in terms of the writing, you know, having a regular job and two little kids, like it's hard to say 6 a.m. to 10 a.m. is my reading, my writing time or something. But ideally, that's what it would be. I mean, I, I do as much research as I can, um, surround myself with lots of binders of material create outlines, uh, usually a one page outline of the entire book so that I can see how it's going to all flow. And then uh, much more detailed outlines for each individual chapter. Um, with Strong Inside, I never left this office that I'm sitting in right now. I wrote the whole book um, in, in one office because I felt like I needed to be surrounded by all my material. Um, I've gotten more organized since then where I can pretty much get all the good stuff into one or two binders. And so pre-COVID, I was able to write, you know, like you think authors might do, you know, at a coffee shop or in a cabin somewhere, like if we had time to do that. But really for me, it's um, trying to squeeze it in whenever I can. I feel like I'm most productive in the morning. Uh, so when I get those opportunities, I think I can be most creative then, but sometimes life just doesn't work out that way. Um, how about you, Ruta? Yeah, the, the process is no process. I wish I had a process only because um, I mean, I, I, I do have a process which I will share, but um, I have a problem writing when I'm on the road. If I'm doing a school visit or an event, I want to give 100% to that school or that li library or the event that is booked me. And so I, I give it all and then I, I can't I don't have anything left in the tank, you know, to write or revise. So I'm sort of a binge writer. I write, uh, I carve out blocks of time when I'm not on the road or doing other work or um, and I just go for it, trying to write 12 or 14 hours per day. I, wow. out, I outline loosely because history provides somewhat of an outline uh, for me. And the real creativity comes in creating the characters creating characters that readers will identify with or feel connected to. And, and it's it's the feelings that will make the text memorable, not, you know, the facts. And um, one of my dear friends, Beth Kephart, um, she's not only my mentor and a friend, but she's like my writing teacher. And I, now during COVID, I'm actually taking some writing classes. Um, and hers is one I've always wanted to learn from her. And yesterday in class, she said something that I think really reflects my process. She said, you need to work the language until you're expressing the feelings, not the facts. And I, I really feel that. Like if I can find the language and the words to express a feeling. So part of my process is really, I mean, economy of phrasing, whittling down those sentences, finding the words that have the impact. That's probably the biggest part of my um process. And that's why I'm so much of a reviser and not a writer mm -hmm. because the wor words don't come out of me, you know, perfectly. Uh, my first drafts are awful. <laughs> awful. awful. Uh -huh. I'm a reviser. Well, I'm excited also to hear that Ann Neely is writing a, a picture book. You know, uh, she has taught that to so many students at Vanderbilt over the years in terms of uh, literature for children. And I'm um, really excited, Ann. And thank you, as Ruta said, for being such a a uh, mentor to both of us and so many other people. Definitely. Yeah. Ruta, I had another question for you. Thinking about, you know, everyone jokes and there's so many memes about 2020 being this crazy year where you don't know what's going to happen next. And so uh, sort of thinking of that mindset, one thing that seems intimidating to me about writing fiction would be that you don't know what's going to happen. Like literally, you have infinite possibilities of what you might have someone say or do or what could happen in your book. And that would be paralyzing to me, you know, to know that so much rested on on my creativity and thinking about what would work and what wouldn't work. What would that would never happen, you know, and curious how you um, 
deal with that yourself when you go into a book and it's guided maybe by history and what your characters, um, you know, realistically might do or not. But how do you take infinite possibilities and, and, and turn it into a compelling uh, narrative story? That's a great question. Thank you. Um, as I mentioned, I interview countless people, um, uh, you know, true witnesses, but then also people, let's say, who are experts or historians, academics on this topic. Um, but when I'm with the true witnesses um, and I'm listening to them and truly listening, because what they have to say is much more important than any question I could ask about the time period. But I find that when I'm sitting with these survivors, let's call them, um, that common themes will emerge. Um, things that they feel are underrepresented, um, things that have stolen their dignity, um, how they feel misunderstood. And I take elements, threads, let's call them, from each of these people that I'm interviewing, and I weave them together to create composite characters. And by doing that, you know, in fiction, I maybe I could represent a larger human experience, maybe, or not a larger, a more combined human experience um, than let's say if I only focused on one family. So what really it's those interviews that are my guardrails that keep me in a lane. Um, mm -hmm. Because as I'm going through, for example, in with my book Between Shades of Grey, that represents you know the story of the people of Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia, Poland, you know, who were deported to Siberia. There were very common um, themes, common experiences that they wanted reflected on the page. They were very open about that. And so my obligation is are to those people, um, even, I don't want to say more than the facts, but that really, it's like my bumper rail. And with Fountains of Silence, um, it was difficult to stay in the lane because the history was so fascinating. The book is set during the Franco dictatorship in Spain, and it's the setting is a hotel, the Castellana Hilton. And that hotel, oh my goodness, it was an American hotel, the first Hilton in Europe, was opened amidst a dictatorship. And the Americans were so badly behaved. Frank Sinatra threw his case of toupees through a window, and Ava Gardner destroyed a suite. Like, it was so juicy, Andrew. I wanted to write all about it, and I couldn't because did it serve the history and did it serve these human beings that I interviewed that shared their story and told me what was important to them? It didn't. So those sort of, those interviews, those human beings, they're my guardrails. Okay. Yeah. I that have makes a, a lot of sense. I have a question for you. Um, okay. So in Games of Deception and also in Strong Inside, uh, and this is something that viewers who are thinking about writing even about nonfiction or historical fiction even, or personal um, family stories. One of the many amazing things about this book are, are the photos and the historical items that you have included, whether it's a ticket stub, whether it's a poster, a movie poster, but the photos from the time period are so enriching. And I want you to tell us, so as an author of narrative nonfiction, do you have to, do you choose the photos that that support your chapters or what you're writing about? Do you license them? Do you get a budget from the publisher or, you know, or is, is it, you can have as many photos as you want? Uh, good question. Yes. So um, it is up to me on the photos. I do the research to find the photos that I'd like to use or those historical artifacts, like you said. And so as I'm researching the book, I'm kind of keeping on a parallel track an idea of pictures that I come across or items that I come across that I might like to use in the book. I think especially with um, young readers, uh, I think pictures are really important to help tell the story. Um, and also I think literally to help them get through the story. I think if a kid sees there's a half page taken up by a picture that might keep them progressing, you know, through that chapter. So I think, have that, I mean, literally you could have, um, a section of pictures within the middle of the book, or you can have them scattered throughout the book. We've all seen books that ha handle pictures differently. And I like to, to scatter them throughout the book for that reason of just uh, momentum uh, for the reader, help them get through a chapter a little bit quicker. Um, I, you know, you, as the author, you're responsible for any costs associated with the pictures. And so uh, with Games of Deception, I was able to get a number of pictures from the United States Holocaust Museum which provided photos for free. 
uh, which was terrific. Um, but in other cases, pictures from say the Associated Press or Getty Images, some of those photo sites, they can be upwards of $500 uh, for the rights to include a picture uh, in the book. And so it really is a quite a question, you know, just as a personal budget, <laughs> like is including this picture that's gonna cost $500 worth it for this book? You know, our readers aren't gonna know that you, if you chose not to include it, but what value does it add to the story? Um, and so I've uh, erred on the side of uh, spending more money um, to, uh, you know, you only get a chance to publish your book once. I wanna make it the very best possible book it can be. And so if there's a picture I feel like needs to be in there, it's gonna be in there. Um, I got smart enough to ask for a photo budget uh, with my next book that's coming up and the publisher was willing to um, provide uh, some money up to a certain cap to help pay for some pictures. It won't be enough to cover all the pictures in the book, but it's definitely going to be helpful. Um, but uh, yeah, I think the pic good pictures can really, really help. Um, and I, one thing I try to do with my books is place the, the sports story within the cultural context of the times. And so I try not to have just all um, sports action shots, you know, but singled out that's coming out in March has pictures illustrating the gay rights movement of the 1970s that was happening as this baseball player was was making history on the field. And so I thought including photos that show that aspect of society was really important. I think it is. And it also just enriches the ex experience. I, I love it. I, though, I wonder if some people watching are like me. I am Photos are such a temptation to me yeah. that I, I will want to go look at all the photos first. And I literally have to stop myself from doing that. And mm -hmm. so in Fountains of Silence, um, I wanted to put in photos. Again, I, I didn't realize either like you that it's the author's job. You know, you have to pay for the photos. Um, but I had selected all these photos, but I decided to put them at the very back. At the, I mean, I mean, really like. <laughs> and yeah. look, so there wouldn't be a section, you know, where people could go and um and say, oh, a, photos first. That's a good way to do it too. I mean, sometimes you don't want to give away too much of the story, which a photo can do in certain ways, or a caption can do. My editor and I were just discussing that. Um, some captions I had written to accompany photos were getting ahead of where the story goes, you know. So we had to make some revisions uh, to captions. Captions, exactly. I, I didn't even. Think about that. I think in Games of Deception, your captions per perfectly reflected, um, you know, the narrative and what was going on. I think we have some questions in the chat. I can put on my glasses. Or do you see any that? Um, let's see. Yeah. Okay. What this one? Um, oh. Nicole says that she's read both of the recent titles of ours and enjoyed each and learned so much about the 1936 Olympic his history of the game of basketball and also about the Franco regime. Thank you. Um, <laughs> I'm constantly sharing your titles with friends who have children and grandchildren um, of the appropriate ages. So let's let's say then, what is the appropriate ages, would you say, for our books? Well, for my books, um, I would say anywhere from fifth grade through adult. <laughs> I, I try to write my books in a way, and I, I know, Ruta, you're, you have teen readers and preteen readers and adult readers, and, and, and I do too. I try to write them. Really, the sweet spot is probably upper middle school. Uh, high school through adult. I, I think that especially in nonfiction, there's a lot of um, YA fiction that adults love. I don't think that nonfiction has been really marketed that way, but I hope that my books can appeal really to anybody. I'm just telling a story that I think uh, a lot of people can relate to. But in terms of school visits, I've been to preschools. <laughs> uh, I, fifth grade, middle school, and high school are, are, are um, the ideal ages for my books, I would say. And How about I you, Rudolph? Yeah, I've done school visits. I've, I between shades of gray, there was actually a fifth grade class that read it. I mean, that surprised me. Generally, I would say yeah. sixth grade. Um, my book out of the out of the easy is uh, I would definitely say a high school book. Um, but I try to write my books using a type of language. I certainly am not um, speaking down to. Right. But again, because of my work in the music industry, I'm looking for a certain rhythm, a flow, an economy of phrasing that is accessible for every every age. I don't want to yeah. defeat a reader already. If someone says, "Hey, would you like to learn about Spanish fascism?" <laughs> you know, <laughs> I'm in sixth yeah. grade. You know, I mean, so I think that can be a little daunting. So I find that 
sixth graders all the way up, you know, to uh, people in assisted living facilities. The book I'm working on now is definitely more, will be appropriate for sixth, seventh up, sort of like between shades of gray. Yeah. Okay. And then I think we're, Tyler, do we need to go? I think so. But before we say goodbye, I want to thank you both so, so much. Um, you're one of the humans and this has been really informative. Like I'm like reading these questions. I'm like, oh my gosh, there's so much more. Like I want to ask you because like the historical aspect of books, it just changes things for me. Um, but before we leave, if you guys, I know that we've touched on um, Glenn Burke a little bit here and there, Andrew, but if you want to just leave them with a teaser for what's coming with Singled Out and then Ruta, if you want to just kind of share with us what you're working on before we leave. Yeah, go ahead, Andrew. Yep. Okay. Thanks, Tyler. And thanks, Ruta. This has been fun. Um, Singled Out comes out March 2nd. It's a biography of Glenn Burke, who was the first openly gay Major League Baseball player. And he also was the inventor of the high five. So if you've ever high fived somebody, uh, that's a tribute to Glenn Burke. Um, and then I'm working on a book called Inaugural Ballers, which is the story of the first women's Olympic uh, U.S. basketball team, which played at the 1976 Olympics in Montreal. That'll come out in two years to celebrate the 50th anniversary of Title IX. Well, I can say, I can't, I guess, say everything, but next year is the 10 year anniversary of Between Shades of Grey. Can you imagine? So wow. Philomel, my publisher through Penguin Young Readers Group has some very exciting things coming for that 10 year anniversary. So look for those announcements. And then I am hard at work on a new historical novel that's set in Romania and tells the story of these teenagers who were recruited by the secret police to be informers for the regime. Um, and this is an underrepresented history in general of Romania and the 20 million plus people who suffered uh, under this terrible um, communist regime of Ceausescu. So uh, I'm super excited about that. Awesome. Guys, we appreciate you so much. Um, enjoy the rest of your week. Um, it's beautiful. I know you both have a lot of hiking to do and outside. And um, don't forget, register to vote today if you haven't already. And have a good fall, everybody. Enjoy the festival. Right, thank you. Hi to my parents in DC who are watching who I haven't seen since March. <laughs> Hi to all your parents. <laughs> and Tyler, thank you so much. Thank you to Humanities Tennessee and Parnassus Books and all of the teachers and librarians who support, you know, both Andrew and me. We appreciate it so much. It's been a lot of fun. Thank you. All right. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye.